I was wondering, I'm going to start talking while I'm loading my PowerPoint since I'm cognizant of our limits here. Um, you know, some of you raised your hands with regard to working in the West or not. I wondered if some of you would say, well, I don't know, you know, it extended from the Appalachians prior to the 19th century, um, et cetera. It is a moving boundary, so I'm actually pleased that our first two uh, panelists drew attention to that. So, I'm going to show you all Oh, it's a slippery mouse. A lot of maps. I'm going a little more geographical in my uh, attempts to uh, address the first question, what is the West? And don't get worried, my first answer is really long, and the other two are less long. So, um, assuming I can figure out where my little drive went. Here. And I have to say, it's really quite nice to look around and see a lot of friendly faces, and many of them got awards, and I'm very happy for all of you who got awards. And thank you to Carolyn and everybody else who uh, organized the conference tonight. I am absolutely honored to be standing up here and addressing the questions that have been posed to us. Um, I'm treating it like a homework assignment. Um, and so I'll go through and start first with the definition of the West, and I'm trying to intersperse what might be some boring maps with some pretty scenes of the West, including, um, you know, the beer shots whenever I get a chance. They're just so lovely. Um, so, what is the West? The Western United States comprises or encompasses over half the land area of the nation. I hope you can get a sense of this from the, the maps that I'm showing you here. Um, if we go back to 1991, uh, the one and only Dr. Don Hardesty defined the West as a region that lay west of the 98th meridian, um, passing through the eastern Dakotas, down the Great Plains, and through central Texas. Um, as I noted when I was setting up, the definition of the West has evolved. Um, that definition is sort of where we were in the late 20th century um, uh, in, in terms of historical archaeology. And honestly, I, I feel like things haven't changed all that much. I am defining it here as everything west of the 98th meridian that's shown there on the map on the far left. And I was pleased to hear Chelsea say that there is not a hard boundary. And I love the Just Give Us Time quote <laughs> that James Delgado shared with regard to the Pacific and that um, the so-called frontier, in quotes, no matter how you look at it, is part of a vast maritime network when you think about it from that perspective. Um, I've got a quote in the lower right from uh, Fisher's paper on cattle in Hawaii, and I just love it because it underscores that this ex ex aggressive expansion that kind of comprises what the West is um, did not suddenly end at the borders of the North American continent. Uh, and I would love it if we could get into some Hawaii conversations at some point tonight. Um, but I'm also not afraid to, to you know, go beyond the international date line, et cetera. Um, so something else that Hardesty drew attention to that uh, a lot of us are living and breathing what well with water wars in the West and all is that uh, aridity tends to be one of the defining factors of the so-called geographic West, as you all have just seen. Um, and the annual precipitation of North America map, um, interestingly, just where that 98th meridian is, you can see that something different starts happening with regard to annual pre precipitation, except when you get over here in the PNW, of course, which is one of the complicated parts of the, the argument. Um, nevertheless, for the most part, you can see what's going on here. And so um, Hardesty remind us, reminded us that the ideological and practical means of coping with aridity are something that have to be considered as a core feature of anybody working, living, dealing with the American West right now. Um, however, it isn't just all about environment. Um, it, it is also about colonialism, ethnogenesis, Victorianism, urbanization, the other items that I've, I've thrown down along there. I, I tend to be very environmentally deterministic, and I'll try not to too much tonight. Um, another defining factor of the West is the vast amounts of public land. Um, the, the, or uh, if you're in Canada, it's almost everything. Um, there's an interesting thing going on here if you look up at Canada, but the darker the color, uh, the more public land there is. 
and uh, clearly significant portions of the western states are, are public land. And what this has done is it has allowed for the preservation of large swaths of land as well as archaeological sites on those large swaths of land, assuming they haven't been looted. Um, and so this, in a way, creates a whole other set of boundaries within this discussion of boundaries and peripheries with public land, private land. We've got water wars, but we also have the haters with regard to like federal and state employees in the West, too, because of those boundaries. So for those of us working on public lands, it, it's something that we can't really escape. And I've got a quote up here from Dan Flores, who is a Western historian who just retired from the University of Montana. And I love his quote, noting that the public lands have served as a kind of training topography um, for anything from cooperation to management strategies, etc. He's calling attention to the modern highlands, specifically the Mountain West, and how there are forests, parks, wildernesses that are preserving all of this wild country. And these have been central, as he says, in converting the Mountain West from what was rural backwater to what we like to say now in Western Montana as the last best place. Um, and I believe that. I, I, I'll get to that in one of my other answers. Um, but uh, I am very happy to be living in Western Montana at the headwaters of the Continental Divide in the 21st century. Question number two. How does your own work in the West relate to ideas of boundaries and peripheries? Um, so the definition of the West that I just gave you obviously already addressed this question, what with the aridity and public land and sort of the moving border of how the West and colonization of the West has been defined. Um, but I also think there's an East-West distinction um, that is a significant boundary, and I would really love to, when we're all done talking up here, to hear more from you all. I really wonder how people who have not worked and lived in the West view the West. So somebody please chime in later. Um, uh, the bioregional backdrop, to me, includes all kinds of natural and cultural boundaries. Um, if you think of all the different bioregions in the West, um, from Pacific shores to Great Plains to Rocky Mountains, to Hawaiian Islands, etc., cetera. Um, and so the very idea of the boundaries in this case from the historic period, and dare I, I come forth with some colonial baggage here, but um, it has had deleterious effects on the native peoples, native plants, animals, soil, water, you name it, that are, are living or have been living or endemic to the West bioregions. Um, we also have, oh, I see it's on animation. There it is. I, I wanted to address with this, this particular photo or, or um, image of uh, uh, one of the Sanborn insurance maps from downtown Missoula that the, the boundaries really continue. And when you get into the urban areas, we've got the different types of urban ghettos. And one of my personal favorites is the uh, female boarding that you see on all these. I know everybody knows that that's a euphemism for houses of prostitution, et cetera. But I've become very fascinated, and I'm curious to talk to Priscilla Waiters about this. What is up with all of the Chinatowns sharing real estate with the female boarding? That's another boundary that I think needs to be addressed that I'm sure has something to do with social, cultural, economic, and all of those issues as well, all accompanying everything within the environment here. Not to mention the fact that today we're dealing with intersections between heritage and memories. I'm eager to be involved in the Conflict Archaeology Symposium. I don't know what date it is yet. Um, uh, and, and talk about battlefields uh, and, and, and remind all of us that um, these boundaries and peripheries have also been the result of severe conflicts um, then and now. So I think all that we do is situated within this context of boundaries and peripheries. And I think it doesn't matter where you are, um, but those of us working in the West, I think, are hypersensitive about it. I, as a side note, and this isn't part of my notes, and I know I'm going off script, sorry. Um, I'm on a search committee. The, 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 the people from the University of Montana are probably sick of hearing about this. It's like Groundhog Day, and it's a search committee that's not ending. And I've now been involved with it for two years, but it's to hire Dan Flores's replacement, a new Western historian. And I have looked at CVs and publications for all of the people working in Western history, 
I, I lost count of how many, but it's, it's given me like this crash course in where scholarship in Western history is today. And it is so parallel with what we're doing. It continues to shock me that we don't have more overlap. And I will buy somebody one beer at every conference for at every SAJ conference that I attend until I die if you get an article published in the Western Historical Quarterly. Come on, that's, that's a challenge. Chris Merritt. Um, anyway, <laughs> so shifting uh, and, and kind of going from the note of some of the deleterious effects of the boundaries, I couldn't help but answer Carolyn's question with a thought um, because the, the, the second question with boundaries and peripheries always makes me think of a comparison of like two maps. This being one that shows the distribution of American Indian tribes, cultures, linguistic groups, and compare that with the reservation lands today. And I don't mean to go post-colonial and indigenous archaeology up here, but we can't help but be affected by that. And I, I think as I'm edging toward answering the third question and where historical archaeology in the West actually fits within the greater context of, histor of, of, of scholarship in historical archaeology, I'm really seeing um, that uh, we're making a, a lot of headway with regard to maybe, I don't want to say social justice, but I just did, with regard to figuring out what has happened over the past few centuries. And the post-colonial and indigenous archaeologies are really carrying us there. And when you pause and ask the question, what is the West, and think about boundaries and peripheries, well, this, this is something that is, uh, is, I think, absolutely significant to where we go from here. Um, and in terms of thinking about those of us who have to work with decision makers and land managers, um, there's a lot of headway being made with applying traditional art, traditional ecological knowledge to things like fire ecology. Maybe fire suppression isn't exactly what should have been done. Um, and, and if we start to think about trying to balance our uses and think about all the conservation areas and protected areas, many of which are, are here in the West, um, I, I think we'll be able to make more headway um, with regard to making the world a better place. And I love the Holland Silliman quote about how we shouldn't be discounting the evidence for history on the margins and in times of transition. And these histories on the margins may come from reservations where traditional ecological knowledge still exists and uh, where we might find some better ideas through traditional cultural properties, through land management strategies to not only understand the archaeological sites we might be documenting and the changes that have taken place over the past few centuries, but also how we might actually show archaeology's relevance to other land managers who need it here in this region. We all sit at those tables where we go over environmental impact statements, um, and, and I think that archaeologists have a huge role to play in sort of transcending this nature-culture divide that doesn't exist if you step back a few more centuries. Um, third question. Maybe I'll try to make this the shortest answer of all. Um, how is your work founded, marginalized, peripheral, and or central to current research trends in historical archaeology, etc.? So I have to confess that um, I didn't really think about being on an edge or a periphery until I was asked this question. Um, I, 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 it, I, I feel like my own research is inspired by the region in which I live or work, and it just is. I, I, I haven't thought of it as an edge of anything. I mean, maybe if it was 1890, I didn't think of it that way, but I don't. Um, and so it didn't dawn on me that I might be operating from the edges until that question came up. So although a lot of the examples of my work uh, should be dedicated to drawing on um, research on the edges, a lot of it has included the wealth and strength of a multitude of past social examples from which we can try to draw relevant lessons. And I think that archaeology as a profession, um, quoting Marcy Rockman, we might not be able to provide things like direct food aid, aid to make the world a better place, but we do have the ability to play a substantial role in how the modern world prepares for and responds to things like future disasters and risk management. So um, on that note, I think that archaeology has a, a lot of opportunities for relevant lessons. 
I'm going to skip the global change archaeology slide. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. What I want to do is throw out these buzzwords and not make you read all of them right now, but we've all heard vulnerability, risk adaptation, resilience, sustainability. Last year, I gave a talk, it was called Tales from the Archaeological, or Tales, Archaeological Tales from the West, and I looked at several case studies in the West and kind of broke down how each of those dealt with these issues. And uh, in the end, it became quite intriguing uh, to see that, wow, all these things we're hearing about in the news, we've got buttloads of case studies. And, and I think that this is our, our place to actually um, take a seat at the table and, 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 and you know, rock some boats. Um, I have one final thought that my husband asked me to talk about, and I don't have a slide for it, but we just had a long drive from Missoula and I just came screaming in. And he said, you know, when you first started doing Asian American archeology, span it kind of seemed like it operated on the edges. And now there seems to be all this trans-Pacific involvement with, you're not operating from the edges. If anything, the boundary has broadened with this theoretical approach of transnationalism that you keep talking about. And I said, oh, you listen to me. I love that. So um, that's a success story in its own right. So um, I will sign off with this, this iconic view of Lake Tahoe. And I don't know anywhere on Lake Tahoe that looks like that, but I want to go there. Um, and you know, we, we do have some great resources, archaeological and natural, in this last best place. And, and so I think we have to protect them. It's allegedly our job. And away we go. And, and thank you ever so much for letting me ramble on here tonight.